acquainted with the new standard D25 at an early age, you know, flying back aerodrome, and the airplane has kind of been part of your life, and you've flown more than one of the new standards. So let's talk about the, the airplane a little bit. Uh, you know, I came to him because Dad built the ones here at Old Rhinebeck with Cole and Andy Keith and, and all of that bunch uh, in the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, the two airplanes that they put together were out of, uh, I think, five or six airframes that Cole had acquired back then uh, in, to use expressly for hot and rides uh, here. They had used the Pit Cairn prior to uh, the uh, new standard, and uh, Pit Cairn was always a little hot getting in and out of the runway here. So the new standard was uh, uh, uniquely uh, suited to uh, hopping in and out of this airstrip because of its big, you know, long wing and lots of wing area and lots of lift and could carry, you know, a larger load and you could double your revenue. You know, that was the real trick with the new standard was uh, back then, as much as it is today, you know, you got guys operating in, you know, rides and travel airs or steermans that have been converted to two holders up front or a LACO that can carry two people up front. You know, all of those are limited to carrying two passengers plus, plus the pilot. You bring a new standard into the mix, you add two more people in the, you know, in the cockpit and you carry four paying passengers, you're doubling your revenue while, uh, you know, you're only paying half the operating costs. So that's where the new standard has always been a money maker, you know, for the ride toppers. It's unfortunate that back in the day, New Standard only had the short run that it did because you know they only were able to make the 55 or 60 airplanes that they did, and it wasn't enough to really sustain through the years, uh, you know, so that when we had a resurgence, you know, for ride topping in the 70s and the 80s, 90s, and today, you know, there's not enough New Standards really to go around. You know, slowly and surely we've seen more of them come together. I would think when Cole and you know when Cole put together his two airplanes. In the early 80s, there was maybe only other one or two more flying. So maybe there was four by 82 or so flying, but that's all that was left uh, of the 55 or 60 that were built, you know, in the factory. Um, the majority of them, after the barnstorming era, era, you know, busted or fizzled out or whatever, went on to be crop dusters. And of course, the crop dusters rode them hard, put them up wet, and they. Uh, you know, deteriorated from all the chemical they were carrying and everything, so that there weren't many, if, if any, you know, just you literally count on your hand how many were left in the, you know, late 60s and the 70s. Um, there was only very few of them remaining, you know, to be able to fly with and, and hop rides with. So Cole rebuilt his uh, and started using them here. And I think that started, you know, I think that sort of started a resurgence uh, because after Cole put his on the line, you know, his two on the line here, I know that uh, the Olivers bought 930 Victor and started operating it, it to the southeast and midwest. Uh, I know, uh, you know, the, uh, Rob and Bob Locke with Walter Wright, they started theirs in the mid to late 90s. They built up their two airplanes that Rob had acquired. Um, and, uh, you know, and then uh, uh, the Olivers rebuilt a second new standard, 9194, that uh, they went on to fly. So we've slowly added more to the mix to the point, you know, you can count on two hands now how many are flying versus 15 years ago when maybe there was only five or six flying, there's, there's nine, or, nine or ten of them in the air now. We've got Mike Hart's 928 Victor, which right. uh, flies up at Hampton Airfield and has been going strong as a ride topper. From and 930 Victor's based on the West Coast now. And it's flying, you know, out of Washington and Oregon and, and up the West Coast. The Flying Lady, the white D25 that has the painting on the side of the, you know, the the, the exuberant gold leaf. Yes, that is uh, that might have gone into a museum out there, but my understanding is it's still airworthy. So I think it's pulled out every once in a while, maybe. Um, so yeah, there's uh, there's been a resurgence of sorts, and and we've seen them used more and more. And it's such a big airplane. It's not really the kind of airplane that you go out and just go fly and have fun. It's it's a big airplane. It's heavy for a biplane. It's it's rather large, you know, in size, and uh, and it's just not the most uh, pleasant airplane just to go out and have fun in, like you do in in a traveler or in a steerman or a walker or whatever. Those are a little more sporty, 
they were geared towards sportsman pilots, you know, who wanted an airplane to have fun with just as much as, to, you know, to use for business or whatever. The new standard was, you know, it was built for a purpose, and that was to fly rides and make money. And, uh, and so that's still very much what it's geared towards. So the ones that you do see out there operating and flying, more than likely, are usually flying for revenue. And it uh, seems like, from what I'm hearing, it's an airplane that's uniquely suited to its mission of getting people up into the air, experiencing a co open cockpit biplane experience. You don't want to go far, you don't want to go fast, uh, you don't want to climb, climb fast, you just want to get up in the air, operate out of a short or soft or whatever field you have available, small airport, and uh, let people enjoy the, uh, the bugs in their teeth and the, the wind in their hair. Yeah, and that's what Gates, you know, that's what Gates really meant. That was the only goal for that airplane, for that design. You know, Gates Flying Circus, Ivan Gates, Clyde Pangborn was a partner in that endeavor, and they were using standard J1s that had been modified to carry four people in the front hole. It was a little different than what we see in the new standard in that it would be more of a club arrangement. You had the front two passengers facing backwards and the rear two passengers facing forwards, so they faced each other. And, uh, and they were in standard J1s with Hisso, you know, 180 horse Hissos or whatever. And uh, the, uh, you know, the new Department of Commerce or, you know, that was slowly taking over aviation regulation, uh, whatever it was, 25 or 26, came down on all of the uh, commercial operators and said, you can't fly these old surplus airplanes anymore. We have deemed them too dangerous. And so uh, they came up with a set of regulations, you know, governing the design and construction of commercial aircraft and the, uh, the older Jennies and J1 standards and, you know, all, that, all those other World War I surplus type airplanes that the Marshalls were using immediately became, you know, nothing more than, you know, firewood to them, yeah. unfortunately. Unfortunately, we lost a lot of them that way because that was literally, literally became useless. And so uh, Ivan Gates and, and Clyde Pangborn uh, commissioned Charles, Charles Healy Day, who had designed the J1 standard, to uh, come up with a new design that met the new design regs uh, for, the, uh, for the government to be able to, uh, you know, hop passengers. And, uh, and it was from that that uh, Charles Hewlett Day designed the first new standard, which was called the Gates Day 24, GD24. Uh, it was called the Gates Day because it was designed in collaboration with Ivan Gates. And that was a HISO-powered new standard. It was a, uh, had a HISO engine up front, carried four people just like the D25 does, pilot sat in the back, use that big long elliptical wing, sesquiplane with the uh, smaller, shorter, uh, lower wings. And, uh, and it was further to that design that we saw the D25 you know, evolve with the right uh, J5, first of all, and then uh, eventually uh, the J6. So it went from a, a water-cooled Hispano Suiza that was basically top end of technology in World War I, mm -hmm. standard J1 that was pretty much a 1917 type airplane in terms of aerodynamic technology and structural technology. And you have a set of regulations, you have a new air-cooled radial engine, the famous whirlwind that uh, became heavily popularized by Charles Lindbergh using it on the Spirit of St. Louis crossing the Atlantic. And now you have some ingredients in about, what, 1928? This is, would be 28, 27, 28, that we see the, the first, you know, D24. Gates Day 24. It was Charles Huey Day's 24th design yeah. is where the, the numerical value comes in there. The 20, D25 was further to that design, his 25th design. Um, and of course, I always figured that they called it the new standard because Day had designed the old the standard. Old standard. Yeah. And I figure Ivan Gates walked in there and said, I need a new standard. Yeah. And there you go, D25. And it was perfect. It was perfect. And then 1929 and the uh, stock market crashes and new standard is you know the new standard corporation based out of Patterson New Jersey which was where Gates Flying Circus was headquartered. Uh, Payne Bourne sits on the board of directors so does Ivan Gates along with a couple others 
and uh, and they are actively, in addition to working the airplane on the barnstorming circuit, getting out there and flying rides. You know, Clyde Pangborn, Carl Dixon, um, you know, Gates himself. You know, we're all hawking this airplane, trying to sell it. You know, as a part as partners in the corporation, they were trying to sell the design, make it popular, and uh, and make a business successful. And the crash happened, and uh, no one was buying airplanes. And uh, and so we saw, uh, you know, eventually the uh, company dissolve, and uh, Gates went on his end, and uh, Clyde, you know, continued on through the years, but no longer with any affiliation with the New Standard. New Standard folded in like late 29, I guess, early 30 maybe, um, with only 55 or 60 of the D25s rolled out. They did roll out a few of the uh, two-place trainer type designs, D29, D31. Um, those were geared towards, I think, like Army contracts for uh, uh, primary training and whatnot. Um, there were designs on the drawing board for additional new standards. You know, there was the D27, which was the male plane. There actually might have been one or two of those built, but there's none remaining that I know of. That had the front hole covered over, much like a pit cairn, where you could load stuff in there. I wouldn't think that would have been a very popular airplane just because the new standards aren't known to be very quick. Yeah. They, they are very stately when they fly, so you can't really get anywhere very far. So I don't know that it ever would have gone off very well had they come to fruition with that. Right. Yeah, it was by 1929, 1930, people are starting to look toward monoplanes or yet yeah. things that were almost the next, yet the next generation the next that would give you more speed and uh, better per commercial proposition for long distance. Um, let's talk a little bit about, I just want to continue in, the, in this vein. We know the new standard got, it's probably un rather unique in that it, it's about the only airplane that comes to my mind, and I'm sure somebody will prove me, find other examples, but very, very few airplanes that I can think of would have been designed specifically as a passenger hopper. When you can't use it, there's no dual control set up, so you can't train students. Right. Um, you know, it's it's a, a kind of a, a niche a niche airplane. Very much so. I don't know of, a, in terms of a pure rides hopper for fun, we're not talking like, uh, you know, commercial airline type flying, or, right. you know, point A to point B, strictly, you know, up, look around, see the hometown, down, down, and down type airplane. I don't know of another one. Another purpose-built design like that. Everything else came along for some other reason and either was or has been pressed into service as a ride topper. The, the new standard is the only one I know of that came, came about solely to fly rides at air shows and festivals and, and to hop rides. As we were talking a little earlier today, you know, there's the technological or, or the things that you think of as high-tech, structural, technological, but the Gates Flying Circus obviously had the benefit of years of operational, uh, and they had probably down to a fine art, the, the art of getting passengers loaded, getting passengers unloaded. We talked earlier today about, you know, one of the more glamorous airplanes of the 1930s, the, the Waco YMF, and it's it's a little harder airplane to get in and out of if you don't know it. Um, the, sta the new standard uh, lends itself pretty well to getting people in and out. Yeah, definitely designed with that idea in mind. And you're certainly right, falling back on 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 Gates's, uh, you know, the business of flying rides. You know, these barnstormers in the 20s, late, late teens into the early mid 20s. They hopped from town to town to demonstrate, but really the, the money was in the rides. The yeah. revenue was in getting people up and down as quick as they could. And, uh, and certainly in designing the new standard, they, they lent that design towards that end in that you've got the, you know, the upper wing sits very high above the, uh, above the cabin. So you can literally climb into the airplane without having to cr you know, crouch down. down. A person of, you know, Various physical condition, absolutely age. You've got a really inseam height. You know, you've got a really in. wide wing walk, so that you know you don't have the skinny little wing walk up the side of the airplane. The wing walk on that airplane is two feet wide, or maybe two and a half. 
there's a lot of room for folks to step out onto the wing and step down. Um, you know, it's it's definitely purpose built for that for that you know for that design for that end. And still, still a very good. Good still airplane good, for that, that, that still as good today, today as it was back then, and that's why, you know, that's why I think, you know, coming back around to it, that's why I think we slowly see more and more of these airplanes, you know, resurrected. Yeah. It is a very large airplane. It's very, you know, the wing is very intricate. You look at that elliptical wing, and you know, from about half span out to the tip, no, no two ribs are the same. They're right. all, they're all getting right. shorter. Very, very labor intensive to build. Yeah. The, uh, the fuselage, you know, getting back to the history a little bit, the fuselage is neat because it's actually angled aluminum. Yes. It's not steel tube like most of the airplanes post-1926 or so came to be. You know, the Waco, the Travel Air, you know, the Pitcairn, all these airplanes had steel tube fuselages with wood formers to give it the shape. The new standard was different in that it was angled aluminum riveted together so that in the field, if you had to replace an upright or a piece of the lawn drawn or something, you could literally rivet it into place, you know, uh, refabric over it and still be going strong. You didn't have to weld. You have to weld in there and potentially have fire hazards and all this stuff. Right. right. It's kind of ingenious. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. The only precedent I can think of that, again, I think we talked a little bit, maybe we'll get around to it, of a, uh, somebody that had some experience with Sikorsky having designed that airplane. I think I remember reading that when Sikorsky came to America and was building, built his first airplane out on Long Island, they resorted to using some readily available metal angle iron uh, to build a fuselage of that, that airplane. I think that may have been the airplane that ended up being used as the, the, bomb, the Gotha bomber in, uh, in the movies. In the movies. Um, so let's talk a little bit maybe about the flying, the flying in the standard. Well, you know, Ken, Ken Cassis today had a really great comment because he and I were talking about it. It was a little windy today. Uh, it's a Saturday in September, typical, you know, starting to get fall weather and some gusty conditions and whatnot. And, uh, and the new standard certainly has, in some ways, a dual personality disorder. When everything's great, when it's nice and calm and the sun's out, it is one of the sweetest flying airplanes you'll ever be in. Um, it, you know, it has, you know, good power to weight. It climbs out very nice. Uh, it, uh, it's very solid in the, in the roll. I won't say it has a, a great roll rate, but it's there. Uh, but it's the kind of airplane where you kind of, you know, put it where you where you want it to go, and it'll just kind of head off in that direction. Very stable, and uh, and doesn't have any bad tendencies. You get in, start getting into windy, gusty conditions, and uh, coming back down the land, it can be kind of a handful sometimes. It's a heavier airplane for uh, you know for a lot of air, you know for, compared to a lot of other uh, uh, you know biplanes of the day. It's probably 500 to 750 pounds heavier, you know, sitting empty than most of the others. So when things do start to go wrong, when you got gusty wind conditions, you got the start of a ground loop or whatever happened. There's a lot more weight there to act, you know, on the uh, on the physics of the situation, and so when things start to go bad, they tend to start going really bad really quick. Uh, so you really just try to make it a point to stay way out in front of that airplane, from a you know from an operating standpoint. You're you're constantly thinking ahead about what's going to happen, you know, five, ten, thirty seconds down the runway as you're taking off or landing, just to keep, you know. Just constantly keeping your your mind on what could go wrong, so that you try and keep it from actually happening. Yeah. Um, you know, we've we've seen a fair number of, of D25s have their issues over the years, back then and today. And uh, I think a lot of it is attributable to uh, you know to the fact that the airplane is kind of as big as one of these can get. With, you one, know? Man, with one man and manual control yeah. without being a superman. You know, there's there's exceptions. You know, Boeing had the 40 and the 80 sure. and whatnot, and Curtis had the Condor. Those are big biplanes. Um, but at the same token, uh, the new standard is, is kind of in its own little niche at the same time. And uh, and it's kind of right there in the middle. And um, great flying airplane until things start to go wrong. 
heavy in weight in, in actual mass, but yes. probably given the amount of wing area, kind of a, a lightly loaded airplane. Very lightly loaded. Very lightly loaded. And uh, you'll, uh, you know, oftentimes you'll be coming down to land with 10 or 15 knots of headwind or gust, and, and the airplane just doesn't want to touch down. You're still kind of floating down the runway, and, and uh, you know, she's flying the whole way. You're literally flying it all the way to a stop. That's just the nature of the beast. Is it, uh, are the control issues you talk about principally roll axis? That's, uh, yeah, Things most of the airplanes, uh, uh, I hate to call it an issue. It's, it's more of just a peculiarity. Uh, of the design is there is so much wing area and, and in that respect I think very little aileron area. Yeah. So there's very little roll rate um, and there's a lot of adverse yaw so it's very much a you know a rudder airplane. It depends on a lot of rudder in the turn and uh, you know and, and there's so much wing there that you'll start the roll and it will roll in and you really kind of have to think ahead of rolling back out because it takes a minute for for it to start going the other way. There's a lot of wing there to move around. So it's a kind of airplane you need to anticipate. It. Yeah, you just got to plan ahead with it. So What's approximate takeoff, climb, landing? I think the airplane probably, uh, you know, lifts off the ground and, and, and comes back to, uh, come back to, you know, comes back to land in that 35 to 40 mile an hour range. So it's pretty slow. Piper cup speeds. Piper cup speeds. Uh, Coming, you know, climbing out once once I break ground and, and I'm climbing out, I'm probably I'm pitching to something over 65 miles an hour and closer to 70, you know, for the climbing. Just to keep things real stable, real nice and, and safe, you know, because you're always thinking of passengers. Sure. Um, leveling, you know, in, in a typical ride at Old Rhinebeck is, is climb out full power to a thousand foot above the ground while you're headed out towards the river. And, uh, and once, you know, when you're flying the rides, the idea is you don't have to go anywhere fast. Right. So once you level off, you pull the power back as far as you can. You lean it as far as you can. You want to burn as little fuel during the ride so that there's more, you know, profit generated. More profit, sure, and less, less breaks in that when you have to fill the tanks. Right. So, uh, you know, so when I level off, you know, I'm pulling the power back, you know, to... Uh, something around 16 to 1700 RPM and you know I'm probably uh, doing about 75 closer to 80 miles an hour. You just go out there and tool around for you know 12 minutes and come back into land. In the pattern nothing changes really until you pull the power back to land you know being the numbers pull the power back you know descend to land and in the descent coming around the base the final I'm looking again for something around 65 to 70 miles an hour. Um, coming into short final, you'll start to, you know, you, you, you might pull that down closer to 60 or 65. Uh, and then I think as you're rounding out, she's touching down in a full stall configuration, she's probably touching down at 40, 45 miles an hour. Uh, if you're wheeling it on, you're probably wheeling it on at something about 50. It doesn't wheel. It wheels great. The airplane wheels great. Although there's those big oleo struts, there's you know that, that can tends to do this a little bit sometimes. So more often than not, I, I choose to three point the airplane um, just because it's very you know very firm and very definite. Um, when uh, when I'm wheel landing it, I'll carry a little more speed and just kind of you know wheel it on and then let the weight settle in. But the tail. Getting back again because it's a very heavy airplane, the tail does tend to settle pretty quickly. It's not the kind of airplane where you can kind of just keep the stick forward and you know wheel land down the runway and keep the tail up. As soon as you start losing the lift on the tail and on the wings, it's very quick to settle back to a three-point position. So you really don't keep the tail up that long anyway. They always appear to me kind of to once they get down, they kind of squat. Yeah. I don't know whether that's the a yeah, lot of that's in the gear, yeah, but the gear. gear was designed that way yeah. so that it could operate out of unimproved fields, farmer, literally farmer's fields uh, back in the day. Very well suited for the runway here at Old Rhinebeck because, you know, obviously the new standard flies more than any other airplane on the field here. Uh, you know, anywhere from 20 to, 
you know, 25 rides in a day on the weekend, so 40 to 50 rides total, you know, actual flights per week, that racks up to a lot of cycles in terms of landings. So you need that big oleo gear to take all that shock of, you know, a bumpy runway in stride and, uh, and not break down on you. And, and at that, it excels beautifully. It appears to be a good slipping airplane. It does. Uh, there's a lot of rudder there. And, uh, and the, you know, there's a big fuselage there, so it's like a big old barn door. When you cock it over, it's, you know, it's coming down. It's very quick to descend in a, in a full deflection slip. To the point where it's very rare you're even going full deflection. You might go half deflection and have all of the slip that you need to, uh, you know, to manage that descent rate. Is it floating in the flare once you... you uh... Oh, it's all dependent on airspeed. If you've got your speeds right, she does not float. You'll just, you'll pitch the nose up and she's very quick to, you know, once you bring the nose up, she's very quick to bleed off the airspeed. Uh, and she just settles right in. Uh, doesn't, doesn't really have a tendency to float. Not really. Now, one of the, I think the highlights of a, of a new standard ride is that, that little bonus at the end, that, that little wing over. Yep. That, uh, Two wing over. Everybody overs. enjoys. Left and right. Left and right. You always, uh, you always kind of gauge that depending on the uh, on the age, uh, you know, the, the average age in the front in the front cockpit. You know, you can have, you know, if, if most of the if two out of the four or three out of the four passengers are under the age of thirty, you might make that wing over a little more, uh, you know, a little more uh, uh, with a little more pizzazz. Let's say it that way. If you've got small children or older folks, you know. Uh, elderly folks in there, then it's more of just a real gentle turn, just to just to bank it over to give them a chance to you know look down and see the ground, because they've been you know when they're flying along straight level, they're just looking out to in, you know to the distance. You really don't get that sightseeing. Yeah. yeah, you really don't get that uh, that real feeling for uh, you know the 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 you don't really get that uh, what's the word for the word. The excitement. The excitement, yeah, yeah. The sense. You get it banked over and you look straight down at the ground and that gets folks going. And that's the real, I think to me, the real sensation of, of flying that we've lost with the, the jet transport airplane. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, I think you, you realize that you, in order to turn fast, fly slow. Mm -hmm. I was always impressed when I saw the when you stand it here that it seemed to practically pirouette yeah. from, you know, as it was from the ground. So, wow, it didn't take very much room to turn that airplane around at all. Right, because it's, so, it's going so slow when it doesn't. Basic flight physics uh, yep. issue, but uh, Absolutely. It, it, it is still space. It'll literally pivot right on a point. Lay the wing, you know, right over on the, you know, lay, lay the wing over pretty steep into the turn, so she'll so turn right around on a point very slowly. It's great. See, the, uh, most of them, I guess all of them, are black card of intentional spins prohibited. Do you know anything about that? I do not. I do not, other than I think that's how it's always been. Um, and uh, I can only imagine it was due to, uh, uh, well, I don't know. You know, there's a fair number of airplanes from back in the day that actually have that same platter. So I don't know that it's anything peculiar to the unique. Uh, but nevertheless, it's not something I'd want to experiment. I wouldn't want to be the test pilot on that, just because it's such a big airplane. You know, it probably has perfectly benign, you know, tendencies in terms of a spin. Um, but uh, I don't know. Dad always, you know, on the two that the, on the two that they built here, Dad did the certification flights, and because so few of them back then, I think, had been made, uh, the Fisdo made him do a dive test. Oh. So he had to, he strapped. I remember, you know, I was like four, but I remember the day he had to do it because he pulled his parachute out and was getting it all rigged right. And and, uh, and he, you know, in, later in my adult years, when I've asked him about it, he said that it was very difficult to get that air. He got to do a, te a test of the NE uh, to the never exceed speed, right up to it. So he said he'd nose it over and then nose it over some more. A little bit more, and it still took forever to get there because there's so much drag on that airplane. It's got a very thick wing. It's got a lot of wires. There's a lot of frontal, you know, right. a lot of frontal drag there. Said, uh, you know, he was 
pitched way over to get to B and E, and it's, it finally got there. But it's a and I guess where I'm going with that is it's a fairly benign airplane in its flying characteristics. So um, I don't think there'd be much of a problem spinning, but I won't be the one. Well, to try. I won't be the one to try it. <laughs> Um, have you have you stalled in this? Thing? Yeah, I mean you do you do do a full stall landing. And, uh, get up Out and about, you know, when when I was, I don't make it a point two regularly anymore, just because I know what it'll do now. But when I was first introduced to the airplane, um, and was going out and flying it for the first few times, uh, I was encouraged, yeah, to go out and you know slow fly it, fly it, you know through a couple stalls, power off, power on. Pretty benign characteristics, you know. It's got a lot of wings, so you know, in a power-off stall, you'll be pulling that stick back. And if you're real gentle about it, the airplane actually kind of just sets up in a kind of a mush and just kind of mushes down. As soon as you let off the back stick, as soon as you let you know let off the pitch, it's flying immediately. And uh, and in a power-on stall, I mean, if you fly right into it, as soon as the nose comes down with the power on, it's flying again. It doesn't have a tendency, at least the ones that I've flown, you know, to drop a wing. Uh, I think they've been rigged pretty well, so uh, uh, pretty, uh, pretty easy going. You get a buffet? Uh, Very little, yeah. a little bit. A little it's bit. not like an immediate, you know, yeah. it's not like it's flying and boom, then it's not. You do get a little bit of that, you know, uh, a little so, bit of that kick. So it's talking to you. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I've, um, I guess with. Uh, I'm talking to people about airplanes of the, oh, you know, pre-1930s era. I'm always interested in kind of their dynamic characteristics, you know, to pilots. And uh, I've heard that some of the airplanes of, uh, of that era tend to tend to hunt a little bit, mm -hmm. you know, pitch hunt, or they. You know, uh, I'm not really sure. I don't, it's not a fugoid. I don't know what what it, what it's a short period or some other kind of oscillation. Right. Or, Quite what it is. Um, do you see that? I don't standard? see it as much in a new standard. I've done, uh, you know, I've done some fairly long uh, cross countries. Uh, not in old Rhinebecks. They stay here, never fly very far. But in some of the other, a couple other planes I've flown, you know, a couple hundred mile legs uh, before, you know, I'm ready to be on the ground. But uh, in those longer trips, she's pretty good about setting up. Mm -hmm. You know, you can. <clears throat> Excuse me. You can you can trim it, you know, to you know a point where it's level and uh, and hold an altitude, and she just kind of trucks along, does very well. I've never really known it to have that tendency to to oscillate like that a little bit. Mm -hmm.